Hi, my name is Guy Wallace and welcome to my video series Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development. I've also subtitled this series The Insomnia Solution. Not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just, just kidding. Uh, this sixth video is going to delve into an overview many of the mentors that I've had over the course of my career beginning back in 1979. Um, I've been very, very lucky to be exposed and have a chance to work with, get to know, and learn from many of these mentors, but some of these mentors taught me, informed me without them being aware of that at all. In fact, some of them were deceased when I came across some of their work, but I continue to learn from them as well. So what I'd like to do here is I'm going to cover the 42 mentors that I have acknowledged on my website in a blog series that I had titled my Friday favorite, my first Friday favorite meant my first Friday favorite guru. See, I can't even remember what, what the heck it was. But I did that back between July 2012 and December 2015. Um, I've added one since then, uh, somebody that I knew back in the day, I knew of them back in the day. I didn't know them personally, although I had met them, but they wouldn't have remembered it. And I was able to kind of do a video with that person. We'll, we'll get to that one later on. So I'm going to go kind of in backwards order from the first ones that I had done. And when I started the series, I had a hard time deciding who should I focus on first. There was some obvious candidates, but I decided that I would go after somebody who I felt had really influenced me quite a bit, mostly informally. Um, but, that, but that I should start off my series with them and then maybe go to the usual suspects. Um, uh, I must, as a word of caution here, not having been raised as an academic in this field, I didn't pay particular attention to who and where I learned things. I just learned them and tried to incorporate them as best I could into my own practices. And so I've done a really poor job of acknowledging some of the specifics and you'll discover that as I mention some names and can only talk in general about what I learned from them. But this first person is one of the exceptions to that and it's uh, Dale Brethauer um, who happened to be best friends with Gary Rumler back at the University of Michigan back in the day. Uh, Dale and I share the University of Kansas where he got his bachelor's degree and I did as well. Then he went off to Harvard for his master's and then he went to the University of Michigan, which is where he met up with Geary Rumler. But uh, so the, of the many things, and, and so I've known Dale since 1979. Uh, when I first joined the society, I knew of him. I don't think I met him until the next spring in April of 80 when I went to my first NSBI conference in Dallas. And I was introduced to many, many people. So I'm pretty sure he would have been in that crowd because he was a Michigan guy and I was in Saginaw, Michigan and the people that I was working with and that were introducing me to everybody, they too were from Michigan. So it was the old Michigan Mafia as they used to joke about uh, back in the day. But uh, I served on Dale's board in, on ISPI's uh, uh, board when he was president in 1999 through 2000 so I got a chance to work even more closely with him and, and you know have dinner and meals with him and spend time. We used to get together for face-to-face -face meetings three days in, at a time uh, throughout the year. So um, I began to appreciate Dale better as a human being, let alone as the guru that I knew him to be. Um, I have many artifacts from Dale in my metal file cabinets that I digitized about 10 years ago and then I lost that hard drive and spent uh, a couple years actually and several hundred dollars trying to get that thing uh, to recover the data that was in that drive. I lost many many things and among those were many of the original early artifacts that I have from him. So all I have today are my takeaways from the lessons learned about that. Um, so I, if I think about Dale, it was about performance-based instruction and he and, and the model that he had created, co-created with Gary Rumler way back in the 60s when during their time at the University of Michigan. Um, and that was what Gary calls the general systems model. Um, and that's probably the one that's a little bit more prevalent. Um, but it, it's basically your input process outputs model with feedback loops with a consequence 
loops on that, uh, downstream receiving systems. Anyway, it was their picture of uh, a single process and then of course organizations, enterprises are comprised of many, many, many processes. Uh, but anyway, so this is at the core of how you need to look at performance and you know people need their knowledge and skills via training or some other means in, or in the process box and to recognize good inputs from the bad ones uh, to process those through task performance and whatever and then produce outputs that are inputs downstream and feedback can come from downstream it can come from when you produce the output and inspect it before you ship it just feedback that comes from within the process itself and that all loops back to as another set of inputs um, to the process. Anyway, so this was uh, very meaningful to me when I first came across variations of that and when I saw the work that he and Gary had done, you know, I embraced it. It made perfect sense to me. So that was Dale Brethauer. So I let off my, if I can say it correctly, my first Friday favorite guru series, 42 people that I tried to acknowledge. The second person on my list was, in, uh, was uh, Gary A. Rumler, um, who I had met at the ISPI conference in 1980 uh, after learning all about him and his work. In fact, um, I learned a derivative of a derivative of his analysis methodology when I first went into a training organization. And uh, because the two people that I work closest with in the training development subgroup of the training services organization at Wix Lumber in Saginaw, Michigan, those two people had worked with Gary's brother, Rick Rumler, back at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Detroit. And uh, the reason they were there was because Gary Rumler's brother-in-law worked in that training organization, was kind of instrumental, and Gary was instrumental in getting those two people in there. And then I came in really the week after they joined the organization. So uh, I had field experience at Wix. They didn't have any. Uh, I had video experience. My degree was in radio, TV, film, and we were going to move from 35 millimeter uh, slide strips with audio tracks, we were moving to video. You know, video was going to save education, video was going to save training. Uh, you know, I've been hearing this for 40 some years now. Um, it's not necessarily true, but it's not necessarily totally wrong either. Uh, video can be a, a, a particular media that you can use that is either appropriate or not, given the learner's um, situation and their learning context within their performance context. Anyway, so. Um, Gary Rumler was very instrumental to me. I left Wix Lumber after 18 months and joined Motorola's Training and Education Center, MTech, and they were bringing Gary Rumler in. Bill Wiggenhorn, the new director of that organization, was bringing Gary in. And in fact, before Bill got there, a woman who was opening his mail to see what should be saved and what could be thrown away, she saw my resume and at the bottom of the first page it said, you know, advocate or proponent or practitioner of the methods of Gary Rumler. And so she thought, oh, we're having Gary Rumler come into our organization here as soon as Bill Wiggenhorn arrives. So I'll set this one aside for him. Needless to say, I got the job. I went to work there and my first day on the job was actually a, day, a week before my official start date. I came in to attend a one day workshop put on by Gary Rumler, um, who I had met a year earlier at the ISPI conference. Uh, he wouldn't have remembered me. But anyway, so I got to know him because uh, I served the manufacturing, materials, and purchasing organizations across all of Motorola, and Gary was one of my consultants, which meant that I carried his pencils around from project to project, site to site, and meeting to meeting, and all that. Some things that I learned uh, from Gary is that uh, before we did our work, and there were others like Carol Panza who were part of that effort and a couple others. Um, Gary briefed us at the beginning of each day before we started our activities on the client site. And then we debriefed when we were done at the end of the day. Tremendous opportunities for learning and I think I learned some valuable lessons about him, from him about how to brief and debrief people uh, you know, trying to demystify what you're going to see 
what I'm going to do, what I'm looking for. Guy, take copious notes. You're looking for these kinds of things. Capture these things here and then we'll debrief about it at the end of the day. So it's a tremendous way uh, that helped me learn. And it was much like, you know, the person that I worked for, for uh, at Wix Lumber, Gail Tonga, who basically did the same kind of a thing, same kind of approach when she was teaching me to do analysis a derivative of a derivative of the Rumler methodologies for analysis. Um, so Gary, again, was a great mentor and uh, I worked with him uh, throughout the years, introduced some of my clients to him. He got consulting work from that. Um, I, uh, I asked him to review my book because I said, you know, I'm uh, acknowledging and attributing what I learned about performance analysis to you. So if you're a little bit concerned about that, perhaps you want to take a look at what I've written, the entire book, before I, you know, acknowledge you as the source for this thing, because you might want me to take it all out. And I was kind of teasing him, but he said, sure, come on down. I went to Tucson, spent a couple days with him, reviewed the book and all of that. He and I also worked when I became president of ISPI at an initiative that uh, took three years across the entire society, uh, at least that's what we were trying to do, uh, to clarify HPT, Human Performance Technology. What does it include and what doesn't it include? ISPI and NSPI before them were basically calling things instruction or non-instruction. Their awards categories were instruction and non-instruction, and that non-instruction thing is a big thing, much bigger, much broader, having more impact than the training or instructional world could. If you believe Deming, he said 94% of all of the problems in business, in manufacturing or wherever, are due to the system, which is under the control of management and not the individual performers. So one of the things that I learned from Gary also is that he tended to give the, the benefit of the doubt to individual performers. And when he was looking at performance problems, he didn't immediately go to the individual and what their knowledge and skills were. He had moved way beyond that uh, starting back in the mid 60s. And they were looking at what are the other variables about process performance that you really need to look at and you're looking for gaps in those from the ideal um, and start there. But you don't start looking at the individuals and you don't knee jerk reaction and start doing training. Even if that's what your client came to ask you about, you say, sure, let me take a look at that. And then you try to uncover what was really going on and what was really at the root of the symptoms that you would normally see. Anyway, so Gary Rumler, uh, both Gary and Dale are in my top five of mentors, gurus, if you will. But warning, I've got eight in that top five, so it's hard to uh, skinny it down. Uh, the next person I'd like to acknowledge is uh, Civil Asylum Tiagarajan. Now, the rest of the world knows him generally as Tiagi. And Tiagi has been, uh, had great impact on me. Um, my huge takeaway from back in the 80s was his phrase that I don't know that he uses all the time nowadays, this is 2020, is that all learning happens in the debriefing. And it's about, uh, you know, causing reflection of what you've learned, how that ties to your prior knowledge, uh, what you're going to learn next and how it ties to that, you know, downstream and some learning intervention. Um, but that if you didn't do that reflection, uh, not, it wouldn't likely stick knowledge and skills. And so I, I always enjoyed going to his sessions at NSPI and ISPI because I always learned something. It either reinforced things that I was doing and gave me uh, more confidence in what I was doing because hmm, he said he said those kinds of things. But um, so I acknowledged him in in my series here. Um, funny thing about that about Tiagi is uh, he's been in this country since the 1960s, I believe, is when he came over. And in 2012, I happened to be riding from the airport in Toronto to the uh, ISPI conference site for their 50th anniversary conference, and Joe Harless was coming out of retirement to come and give a presentation. So he asked me in the car, he said, why is it Tiagi's accent is exactly the same as it was in 1960? Anyway, so um, that's a little bit about uh, Tiagi and uh, love him dearly and uh, all that he has contributed to the performance orientation to instructional design. 
Um, there's a lot to learn from that man. And of course, he's quite the master at it. Uh, he can build the airplane while flying it, and uh, many of us cannot. And uh, But uh, he has got so much that he has learned and experienced that he can easily bring that to the fore for any situation that he's uh, facing. Uh, one of my favorite stories about him before I move on is um, somewhere, and I think it's on a video, where he's talking about he's meeting with some group and, and they're kind of being uh, wise asses and uh, they're giving him a hard time and he says, you know, what should you do with customers that call in about with customer complaints? And their answer was, you know, um, ignore them. Uh, they were joking around and they said, you know, things like, you know, uh, uh, make them go away and not be customers anymore. And so he kind of went along with their feelings that they were expressing and got them to the point to where they realized what they were saying was like, was they were going to lose business and potentially their job because there wouldn't be the volume of customers um, that they were there to satisfy, to serve. Um, but anyway, so I, I think he's just an ideal model for um, taking what he does seriously, but not taking himself so seriously. And I hope that uh, I've uh, borrowed some of that from him in my practices. So he's another one of my top five, the eight people in my top five. Um, the next person I'd like to acknowledge is Tom Gilbert. I met Tom Gilbert back in the 1980s at NSBI. I didn't, he didn't know me. I really didn't know him personally, um, but I knew of his work because when I had joined the training organization in 1979, they would given me two books to read: uh, Bob Mager's Analyzing uh, Bob Mager and Peter Pipe's book, Analyzing Performance Problems, or They Really Ought to Wanna, and they gave me Human Competence. But in truth, it took me three attempts to get through performance competence because it was a fairly dense book and it was kind of academic and uh, I didn't I wasn't raised in in the academic approach to instructional design and I you know I'm a radio TV film guy so I was there for a lot of fun and things like that so I didn't take that approach seriously you know in, in retrospect maybe I should have uh, I don't know but anyway so I learned a lot from him and his writings and the human competence book was uh, central to that and there's a couple pieces within that book that are particular favorites of mine one of them is very popular it's known as the behavior engineering model BEM and uh, that's what Carl Binder has turned into the six boxes he's got a friendlier version of that with friendlier language uh, other people like Donald Bullock uh, back in the day back in the 80s um, was a big proponent of the behavior engineering model and so I learned a lot about Tom's work through Donald Bullock and also from uh, uh, Donald's no longer with us and the late Roger Chevalier who also was a proponent of the behavior engineering model but on the page before the behavior engineering model in the book Human Competence there's another chart that's very similar another six boxes and that chart matrix was labeled the model for creating incompetence. Now I had uh, one of my one of the people in my uh, organization back in at uh, when I was working with Ray Svensson created two huge posters of those two models, the behavior engineering model and the model for creating incompetence and those hung on my wall in my office um, because I had early on started showing clients the model for creating incompetence first and I open the book and show them that model and they would look at that and go oh yeah that's that's kind of what we do <laughs> we create incompetence around here because we're doing those things I said well the good news is flip the page there's the behavior engineering model these are the things you need to attend to in order to affect performance and mostly individual performance is kind of what Gilbert was all focused on um, but anyway so he's he is uh, often referred to as the father of human performance technology and when that came out Mark Rosenberg and Bill Detterline kind of tagged him as the father of human performance te technology and uh, that uh, ruffled some feathers across NSPI and ISPI because there's many who had said you know it's really not him exclusively um, many would attribute it back to B.F. Skinner um, and his impact and where they took that 
Um, but needless to say, you know, he's often referred to as the father of human performance technology and had a significant impact. And there's many wild stories about Tom Gilbert. Judy Hale has one about uh, Tom, who is, was known as a, a fairly heavy drinker, alcohol, um, loved a particular type of soda pop. Uh, that's what some of us in the Midwest of uh, the United States call that stuff. Um, but, but Judy Hale found out that he liked this particular type of soda pop. And so she would take a six pack to him in New Jersey from Chicago whenever she went. And it was only available in the Chicagoland area. Um, Judy tells this story. I've got this captured someplace on the video. But so, so whenever she was going to meet up with him, he would ask her to bring more of that to him. So that's kind of a funny story. But, uh, you know, we're all humans, and uh, his book, Human Competence, is a, is a pretty big uh, deal and a great reference. And also later on, before he passed away, he, and I think his wife Marilyn had to uh, finish up this book, but it was uh, um, Human Incompetence. So kind of the flip side about that. And now I think that now that I mentioned his wife Marilyn, uh, it should be known to all that uh, Marilyn was created was uh, often credited to be the genius alongside of Tom that actually got his uh, ramblings and his writings into finished form. And I believe she was instrumental in finishing up the book Human Competence. And so much credit needs to go to her. Um, uh, my next person is another one of the people in my top five, uh, and that's the uh, late Joe Harless. And Joe Harless was a character for sure. Um, he's got stories that he told about when he was at the University of Alabama, and he was uh, he walked on to the football team, and he the coach then was uh, Bear Bryant, very famous in football college football circles, and especially if you're from that part of the country in that conference, but. Uh, so he was a walk-on, and, and he tells the story of uh, uh, one of the coaches saying, hey, the coach wants to see you, meathead. And uh, so he went to go see the coach, and the coach said, okay, I've, I've been looking at your, your transcript here, your grades, and uh, you're a really good student, and, but you're not a very good football player. And so I need you to be a tutor and tutor some of my better football players who aren't very good students. Um, but... Uh, uh, Joe uh, was a student of Gilbert's and changed his major because of a, pro, of, a, of a class that he had walked in and sat down and he was in the wrong class, but he was intrigued by the professor at the front of the classroom, and that was Tom Gilbert. So Harless became a Gilbert a devotee and a follower and um, um, brought his own version of that to the marketplace. So ja Joe Harless was known for many things, but one of them is job aids and defining the use of what uh, Rumler and Gilbert were calling uh, guidance um, in their business practice in the 60s and 70s, and, and Harless in the 70s and 80s was calling it job aids, which was became a more popular term, and that term still exists today, even though many people are calling it performance support or workflow learning and quick reference guys and electronic performance support systems which came uh, uh, back in the early 90s late 80s um, but anyway so Joe uh, spoke a lot about that and again he had a great sense of humor he was kind of like a southern preacher uh, he called uh, he called me brother guy or brother Wallace and I would say brother Joe brother Harless and uh, when I first started my HPT video series back in 2008 I called him up and I said, Joe, I want you to be the very first person to do this. So I know you're retired and you're not going to the conference. So before I go to the conference, I'd like to come and visit you in the southwest suburbs of Atlanta. And I made the four or five hour drive from Charlotte, North Carolina to go visit with him and to do two. And I did a, two videos. I did a short one, which was, I was calling at the time HPT Practitioners. I hung a, a laminated uh, set of questions on the front of the camera, and the person just spoke to those questions, answered those questions, looking into the camera. And then I said, well, let's do another video here. Let's just sit down over in the corner of your uh, uh, rec room here, and uh, I'll set up the tripod, and we'll just do an extended thing, and I asked a lot of questions and all that stuff. Well, my camera battery went dead in the middle of that extended interview, unbeknownst to me. So he and I finished up this interview, but when I went home and checked the video, 
I had nothing for that second time, so I immediately called him up and said, oh, I screwed up and my battery went dead and it's just my little, you know, I'm using a little camera uh, and, you know, nothing sophisticated. And uh, um, I said, you know, so what I'd like to do is come back next year and do the short version and an update. And there wasn't much to update, but uh, I wanted to <laughs> get an invitation to come back so I could do that sit-down longer interview, which I started calling that portion of my series HPT Legacy. Um, but I went, so I went to the conference after that and uh, uh, did a whole bunch of other people, but I, I was lucky and honored to be able to showcase Joe Harless because he had retired. There were many people who were part of ISPI at the time who knew of him but didn't know him. And uh, I was happy to share, you know, video of the man telling us his story. And I went, and went back in 2009 and got the extended story, which is very interesting. He was telling me about he spiked Gary Rummler's drinks so that he could beat him at table tennis, ping pong. And uh, um, Gary got wise to that. And the next time he visited, he didn't have any drinks and he smoked Joe on the ping pong table. So uh, they, these were very competitive people. They were competitors in business, but they were also shared amongst themselves to learn from each other. So even though they were, you know, fighting for business out in the marketplace, uh, you know, that's how they rolled. It was, uh, and they were always, Joe was one of the people who shared. And uh, when he came to the 2012 conference, I had told one of the people um, that was from my Charlotte chapter about, you know, hey, you can walk up to anybody and talk to them at this conference. Well, I happened to be walking through the hallways somewhere and I saw this guy, he was on the periphery of a three-person conversation between Joe Harless and Kathleen Whiteside and Danny Langdon, Kathleen's husband. And the three of them are chit-chatting there. And this guy, John Hewn, John, hi, um, was about standing about six feet away. And I was making a beeline to someplace I was going and I turned around and I said, John, join these people. Joe, invite John to come in. And, and I could hear Joe saying, John, come over here, join us. Boy, don't sit so far back here, come over here. And so John joined them and I think that they went and had a lunch together or something like that. I can't remember the rest of the story. But, but that just was one example of how open these big name gurus were. Even if they were had a rough, gruff exterior, they were always willing to help somebody um, they might not suffer fools easily, but, uh, if, but if you came and had some genuine interest in what they were doing and asked intelligent questions, they were more than happy to invest in your development. And I felt that that's what they had done for me way back in the early 80s. And uh, it was very true, but Joe was, was uh, very open and shared uh, from a tremendous amount. Um, there's a lot of jokes about Joe Harless, and uh, he was always in it for the buck. And uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know that's what you had to do to survive in the business world. But uh, so Joe is again one of my uh, one of the eight people in my top five. <clears throat> the next person is Bob Mager, Robert F. Mager. Um, criterion reference instruction was a big deal. I I, I read Mager's book and Pipe, Pipe's book, analyzing uh, performance problems, or you really ought to wanna. And I was, I was so excited about that book. They, I was given it, I read it, uh, stayed up late and read the thing cover to cover. The first day I had the book, I was so excited about that book that I went back to the office the next day and I ordered four copies and then put them in the U.S. mail. This was 1979. Put those in the U.S. mail to my four best friends from college who then wrote me back and said the equivalent of, what the hell is this crap all about here? What's, what's, what's with you, guy? Well, they didn't get it, but I did. And I was so excited about working in a training organization where they were gonna be focused on improving performance, and if training was a part of that, instruction was a part of that, yeah, fine. But often it's not. And there's a great flow chart, job aid in that book. Uh, all of the people had them. Harless had his version of that. Gilbert and Rumler had their versions of that. Uh, um, uh, Dana Gaines Robinson and Jim Robinson, they had a version of that, many versions of the same thing. But basically it helped you kind of determine uh, diagnostically, Socratically, whether or not training instruction was going to solve the problem because it was a deficit of knowledge and skills. And often that's not the case. There's usually other variables going on, as I mentioned before, and what Deming had said. But um, 
So, and Bob, I, I learned from Bob the three-part behavioral objectives, learning objectives, um, that were either uh, uh, terminal objectives or enabling objectives. So the terminal objectives, to me, the way I learned about that was that that was the performance capability, competence that one would be able to exhibit back on the job. That's the terminal goal is to be able to perform. We had enabling goals, however, that were basically, in order to be able to do, you got to know stuff. And so the knowledge level, knowledge and skill level objectives were the enabling objectives, and they should have the three parts to them. And I won't go into all that detail, but um, um, that's where that kind of comes from. And the way I learned all of that is that wasn't for the learner, that was for the developer. So in the design phase, you would, based on your analysis data, you would craft these terminal and enabling objectives and that would provide guidance to the developer which might be the same person that did the design or it'd be handed off to somebody that would be developing and it would keep them on the straight and narrow path focused on people got to know this stuff in order to be able to do this performance critical uh, we seem to have lost that we we come up with the knowledge objectives that seem to be be created after the development has been done so it's it's being done should be done backwards performance should drive the knowledge and skills required those should should drive the objectives constructed and those objectives should drive the actual development of content and we're doing it backwards backwards and we're creating content then coming up with the objectives then coming up with the tests of those objectives um, uh, and it's unfortunate, but it's too prevalent and it's something that existed back in the late 70s and early 80s. So it's nothing that's new or a result of e-learning taking over. Um, it was an issue way before e-learning uh, made it onto the scene. Um, I asked, so in 1999, uh, Bob Mager had done a banquet speech and he had titled the banquet speech the perfect banquet speech and i knew this thing was captured on video and so i reached out to bob and said hey i've got i've acquired a copy of that and i would like to post that online if you'll let me and he said well i need to see it and approve it first so I created a first version of it, he rejected it. I created a second version of it, he rejected it. I created a third version of it, he rejected it. And finally, the fourth version or fifth version, he accepted. And part of it had to do with, um, you know, some of it was grainy and I had to play around with, you know, making a fairly sharp video and I don't know exactly what he was looking at it on, on his end. But, um, so I finally got something that was uh, that was acceptable to him, and it's a hoot of a video, but there's a lot of inside jokes and things like that. So people who don't know the other players that he's mentioning may not find it uh, um, a, 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 as entertaining as uh, one might. But some of the things he mentioned in the video are really critical. He talks a lot about uh, testing, testing your content before you release it, and the importance of that, and you give some examples of how that's been poorly done outside of the instructional arena um, but but to make the point that you know we need to be very careful uh, especially as we're going global and he mentioned this so this is going to be a huge issue one culture dealing with people from other cultures um, so this was a heads up in 99 about you know it's not that that was new at that time it had been around for quite a while but it was going to become even more prevalent and more of us were going to have to be pay attention to our content and the cultural cues and cues in that and how that might offend people and so we had to be very aware of that and and through testing you could figure out whether or not what you've produced is okay culturally acceptable to other cultures um, we often have our blinders on and, and aren't uh, cognizant of that and wary of what we're producing seems to work for us and so that's fine <coughs> excuse me um, another guru is Neil Rackham I met Neil in 1981 Neil is of spin selling fame so you know you, you this is a Socratic approach to sales calls and you need to ask situational questions and then draw out the implications of those to another set of questions and then determine excuse me problems in the situation then the implications of those because some problems are you know nickel and dime problems and other problems are million dollar problems and so you, really what you're trying to do is understand the 
uh, client, potential prospects, um, situation, the problems in, inside that and the implications of some of those problems and Socratically bringing them around to going, yeah, I got a lot of problems, but you know, these are the big ones. And then you bridge your products and services, features, advantages and benefits to the needs to be paid off based on those implications. And so you're trying to build that prospect into an advocate for your products and services because they meet your needs. And if you determine that the implication of this problem is millions of dollars, if I have something $200,000 to solve your million dollar problem, there's a huge return on that investment and so you could build, make a prospect that you're making a sales call on it to be a proponent for your solution because they could always already see now there's value in purchasing this product or solution and using it because we'll get this return. Um, anyway, so uh, I had Neil Rackham was uh, very influential for me. I worked with uh, some of his people back in Sheffield, England on their win-win negotiations program and I helped bring that into Motorola for my target audience was the purchasing agents and also there was another audience of salespeople in Motorola and also there was a third audience and that was contract negotiators. Um, Motorola made uh, secretive communications uh, things for the US government and probably others and there were these were the people who had to negotiate with the government about the bat black box and you know you're gonna build two of them and it's gonna cost millions of dollars and somebody had to negotiate here to you know arrive at an agreed upon price delivery schedule blah 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 and so those were my three audience that I served uh, with this win-win negotiations program which was part of the Huthwaite offerings back in the day in the in 1981 and 2 and so I met with uh, one of uh, Neil's people I'll be talking about him a little bit later in this list but Neil trained me and Barbara Warburton to play a role as behavior analysts in this negotiations program and the way the program was set up is that people would go through simulated uh, negotiation settings and we the behavior analysts would be marking you know what are we hearing from the one person are they giving information seeking information testing understanding summarizing defending attacking building on somebody else's ideas shutting people out there were a number of these kinds of communications behaviors and what the deal was is that at the beginning of a negotiation just like at the beginning of sales uh, the negotiator or salesperson exhibits certain behaviors uh, more prevalently than others and then as you move into the middle of that cycle the behaviors shift and at the end of the sales call or negotiation you're doing a different kind of behavior the the prevalence of testing understanding and summarizing is much heightened at the end of a sales call or a negotiation because basically they're the same kind of a thing um, and so it was, it was a tremendous thing that I learned from Neil Rackham uh, and his group um, and uh, I was uh, I introduced Neil to a couple of my clients that became some of his biggest clients and so he was very appreciative of that and when I was president of ISPI back in 2003 to 2004 the April 2004 conference in Tampa was my conference and I got to pick the keynote speakers so I was able to uh, enlist uh, Neil to come and be a keynote speaker um, and I've told this story in this video series a couple of times already so I won't go into it again but uh, but he was a, a, a great friend and colleague and professional and he was all about performance his first company I believe was called performance improvement uh, back in England back in the 60s I believe and um, uh, he kind of moved on from the NSPI thing that was going on in focused on sales because that's where he had done a, a lot of research and he became renowned for you know being the master of sales and sales processes and things like this consultative selling is how what it's known as and uh, it's really all about win-win selling don't you know not transactional selling one time and you'll never see the people again but this is for long building long-term relationships which is important to consultants and so when I became a consultant there were many things that I had learned from Neil Rackham 
uh, that I applied, you know, throughout my career and yet to this day. But uh, again, Neil is one of the eight people in my top five. <clears throat> uh, the next person on my list is Margot Murray. Um, and I met Margot early in the 80s, and Margot is known for mentoring programs and having a performance orientation. She came out of the AT&T Ma Bell system, if you will. She was she knew Ray Svenson, who was my business partner in the early 80s, um, and that's how I met Margot and got to know her and, and value her highly for uh, things that she taught me. Now, it's one of those instances again where I can't be real specific about what I learned from Margo but I know I learned a lot and she either reinforced things that I had learned from others and gave me examples of that um, but uh, so I had borrowed on occasion some of the things that I'd read in her book about mentoring and applied them in things that I was doing with my clients um, so I really appreciate her Another person is Judy Hale, who I met in uh, 1981 when I moved from Detroit, the Saginaw, Michigan and the Detroit chapter of NSPI, and I moved to the Chicagoland suburbs, and I joined the Chicago chapter of ISPI, NSPI back in those days, and Judy was uh, a member and a good friend, and uh, she and Ray Svensson and my wife Karen and I, who were partners in Ray's company, met with Judy uh, on occasion to just share with each other things that we were learning about business, what was going on in the marketplace, uh, what, what clients seem to be looking for, what are they concerned about, etc. And uh, we did that for a number of years with her. Um, but she's a great friend and uh, she's uh, um, a great example to many other people. Um, and she freely shares all of her work. She's written a number of books. I was asked to review one of her books 20 years ago or so, um, but uh, but she's a great friend and uh, she's somebody that everybody should follow and she's still very active in the business. Another person that I'd like to acknowledge is Jane Bozarth. Now I've known Jane through mostly social media um, and met her, uh, actually we were at a Steve Miller concert in Durham, North Carolina and I was in the balcony and she was below but I couldn't find her in the crowd but we were sending text mex messages back and forth as we were doing this and I'd known her for a few years at that point but I invited her to uh, participate in the first year's programs with the Charlotte chapter of ISPI that I had co-founded with the Canshaw and Jane has been an, uh, to that chapter to present three times here by now. Um, and uh, I, what I like about Jane is that she's kind of no-nonsense. She knows the research, she can cite the research, and she freely shares what she knows and provides guidance. And so I've always valued uh, um, her and uh, what she knows, her wisdom and her insights that she so freely shares. Another person, and these are in no particular order, right? I'm not sure exactly how I came up with these, but I was doing these once a month, you know, the first Friday. Um, Carol Panza, who I met in 1981 when she was working with Gary Rumler, and he was working at Motorola, and she was on many of the projects that, that were my projects with Gary and uh, Carol, and we traveled to many of the Motorola sites in Fort Worth, down in Florida, up in Toronto, and... Uh, I learned from her because sometimes I tagged along with Gary, you know, I was tagging along, and uh, sometimes I tagged along with Carol, and Carol would do the briefing and the briefings with me, much as Gary had done, because, you know, he had kind of modeled that, and I guess that's how everybody was doing it. Makes a lot of sense to me, and I've used that as I've developed my own staff over the years. Um, but Carol um, is a true performance professional, performance improvement professional, and uh, uh, again, there's many things that I've learned from her. I've learned her version of organizational mapping. Um, and uh, she, she's just a, a proponent and freely shares and develops other people. Um, she's very involved in the NSPI, ISPI organization as I am. And she's spending a lot of her time and, and has spent a lot of her time focusing on helping to develop performance improvement professionals in Europe. Um, uh, she's a consultant, and she I believe she's still working today. 
Another person I'd like to acknowledge is Allison Reset, who I met again in the early 80s at NSPI. Uh, Allison is, is a professor at San Diego State University. She's uh, retired uh, not too long ago. And I happened to be asked to do a project that with her, but we didn't really work together, but our client at Eli Lilly asked Allison and asked me to document our approaches to analysis and they were going to take a look at the two approaches and I guess take the best from both sides. I've been doing a lot of work with Eli Lilly. I've been doing a lot of curriculum architecture design work. I've been the same group that was at Eli Lilly. Uh, the director and a bunch of the managers had come from Amico. There was I think like 11 or 12 people that went from Amico in Houston, Texas to Indianapolis and went to work at Eli Lilly and the leader of that group was a good friend of Allison's and I had trained a lot of that person's staff and so they had me coming and doing a lot of work at, at, but there was you know differences in how you articulate you know your approach to analysis maybe it's mostly the same with some nuanced differences but uh, they asked her to document her approach they asked me to document my approach um, I was writing a book at the time hadn't any, gotten anywhere near uh, finishing that uh, because this was probably in the early to mid 90s um, and so I submitted mine and she submitted hers and they took the best of those things to craft their own approach to analysis um, so I, but I've known Allison for a long time and I really respect her and just recently I did one of my HPT videos with her and captured her um, she's a gem she's written some really great books first things fast She's got a book on job aids that I highly recommend. Somebody walked off with my copies of both of those books, you know, at some point. You know, at some point you go looking for your book and you wonder, you know, where the heck is it? And ah, it got legs and walked away again. And that's what happens with all the really good books. I've learned that the books that I've actually got the authors to sign them, I hide those away. I scroll those away someplace so that they aren't accessible to anybody else. The next person on my list that I'd like to uh, recognize, again, another person in my top five, one of the eight in my top five, is Richard E. Clark, Dick Clark. Um, I met Dick in the mid to late 90s. Uh, I knew of him before that, but uh, he had written a really great article with uh, Jeannie Farrington about snake oil. And I think I've been battling snake oil, what I call foo-foo, uh, you know, otherwise known as bullshit. Um, that too often pervades our profession and learning styles and Myers-Briggs type indicator and there's just a lot of myths um, or snake oil that abounds and so I always appreciated people who went directly at that because they were teaching me what to avoid and you know I wasn't schooled in all of this so I, I've been learning mostly informally socially uh, and, and again, not formally, uh, all of the things that I know I've learned from all these people who guided me or what I read or, you know, presentations that I saw or working with people directly. But um, one of the things that he taught me was about this uh, concept of, uh, you know, experts, all of us actually, uh, can't tell uh, anyone else all the details that they might need to perform. So what the research shows is that experts will miss up to 70% of what a novice needs. That's the bad news. The good news is each expert knows a different 30% or can articulate 30%, a different 30%. And so if you talk to enough of them, you can basically build something that gets close to perfection. You'll never get to 100% most likely. But I think he gave me a number that if you talk to five people, you get around 85% of what somebody needs. And then of course, if you test it, you might find further what's missing and go and amend your content to make it closer to perfection. Uh, if the goal of instruction, whether that's performance support or job aids or training, um, you know, you want people to be able to perform back out on the job. Uh, you know, so, so what you give them instructionally um, needs to be pretty darn close to perfect so that they can go out there and perform successfully each and every time after they've been trained um, or guided through job aids or performance support, whatever, lots of different names for those kinds of things. Um, 
Uh, so uh, Dick uh, has written a very nice review for me, a uh, uh, recommendation I guess, uh, or whatever they call it on LinkedIn, and uh, it was kind of a surprise. I think I was looking at that and I found that he had done that and he had never said anything to me about it, but it was a very nice uh, complimentary kind of thing and I really appreciated that. And then I asked him if he would review a book that I had written because I needed somebody who was grounded in the research to tell me whether or not what I had written was foo-foo or not. And the book that I wrote and published in 2011, he wrote the foreword for it. And my book is the, uh, uh, the Fifth Management Foci kind of taking off on the fifth uh, discipline of Peter Senge. But mine is about, you know, what are, what are the four key foci, focuses of management, what do they really need to pay attention to? And the fifth foci is how to avoid foo-foo because there's so much snake oil out in the marketplace that as you try to attend on these primary four focuses, foci, that um, you need to be wary. You need to be wary about the snake oil associated with each one of those four. And that's what really the book was about. And it was the book was kind of my uh, attempt to create a book for management and supervisors about human performance technology without using that kind of language and labels uh, because they're often not friendly to the people who are not from that world. Anyway, so Dick Clark, uh, uh, a great researcher, uh, summarizes a lot of the research. Um, he, I'll, I'll mangle this phrase here, but he would talk about in 1983, I think he wrote an article, seminal article about you know, how we deliver our instruction is less important than the design of the instruction. And he uh, made some analogy that, you know, it's the type of truck that delivers food to the grocery store doesn't change the quality of the food at all. Um, and uh, so we can't expect one media or mode of instruction to be superior to others each and every time. One, it depends on, you know, is that media uh, conducive to the kind of content that you're trying to teach is the mode of instruction the kind of thing that you uh, that's conducive to what you want to teach. You're not going to teach people how to drive a car and how to turn into the skid if you just give them something to read. Uh, that's probably not going to be. You need you know uh, hands-on kinds of driving training here after you have the knowledge and skills about what does that stop sign need and mean and the yield sign, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but eventually you need to change that mode from learning knowledge to developing skills and honing skills. You know, how to turn a corner without hitting the curb and, or the cars in the intersection, etc. Um, so uh, Dick Clark is, uh, is, again, one of my top people. The next person I'm going to mention is also one of the top people. Another uh, eight of the eight people that's in my top five, and that is the late Ray Svensson, who was my business partner from 1982. 1997. And before that I'd met him, uh, thanks to Bill Wiggenhorn bringing him into Motorola's Training and Education Center, and Ray talked about curriculum architecture to all of us uh, new training project supervisors. There were 13 of us. And I went off and, and took those ideas that he shared with us and created a training and development path in 1981 for manufacturing supervisors. And it was a modular set of content as much self-paced content as possible because I had been directed by Bill Wiggenhorn, all of us had, to move as much stuff from classroom training into self-paced means because that made it more convenient, easier for learners and their management to get what they needed when they needed it rather than waiting around for a class that might be scheduled every quarter or twice a year which is not timely for people. So if we could move more of that into self-paced instruction, the better. So that's what I did. I created a training and development path in 1981 for manufacturing supervisors across five business sectors. And it was because of these ideas of Ray Svensson, who had picked up these ideas from the Bell Systems Center for Technical Education, where Ray was working and doing strategic planning for them. He'd been in strategic planning at AT&T headquarters. He'd been a Bell Labs manager before that and a Bell Labs bench engineer. Uh, working on RF technologies, radio frequency technologies, uh, back in the day after he came out of college. And he was one of those Bell Lab engineers who was hired when Bell Labs only hired the top 10% of engineering students from the top 10% of engineering schools in the US of A. 
So Ray was one of those creme de la creme engineers. And I recall many times being in meetings with him where everybody would introduce themselves. They'd go around the room and they'd get to Ray and he'd tip talk about his background and everybody would go okay he's the king of engineers in this room this today and then guy would have to introduce himself you know i have a radio tv film degree i worked at Rick's lumber you know not engineering or technically oriented at all and then i'd have to you know prove myself in the context of that meeting and the, and the subsequent meetings and the project activities and all of that stuff but uh, but ray was very generous uh brilliant just brilliant and uh, when he was working at Motorola and Bill Wiggenhorn brought him in he helped Motorola create uh, what I call a governance and advisory system and that's the language that Ray was using in the book that he wrote in the mid 80s on the tr uh, st strategic planning for training and development workbook and so this is uh, his guidance his job aid if you will to anybody who wanted to buy the book and then go and do strategic planning for themselves and do a stellar job, a detailed job, and be driven by the strategic plans of the organization. So the training isn't off doing strategic planning in isolation from the context where they exist and what their role is to support the development of human capability, capacity, competence, whatever label you want to put on that. Uh, so how do you make sure that you're really tied to that? And one of the key th aspects of his approach was establishing this governance and advisory system. And my f I spent 18 months at Motorola, and the first nine months I skip level reported to Bill Wiggenhorn because I didn't have a boss. And they had a, a placeholder in the organization chart, but there was nobody there. And so for the first nine months that I worked there, I was the person, the chairperson, if you will, of the Motorola Manufacturing Materials and Purchasing Council, which were people from the business, the top players, the, either the top one or two people in each of these business sectors that was in charge of manufacturing and manufacturing owned materials and purchasing. But anyway, so I was dealing with the top manufacturing managers and I learned a lot in terms of, you know, uh, what their critical business issues were, as Gary Rumler called those, and uh, that, that's what we were focused on. And so the top leadership of the organization knew for a fact that we were focused on their top business issues and not things with mass appeal, you know, everybody needs this, why don't we build it? No, we didn't do those kinds of things. We were driven by the top, and as the situation in the industry changed, our assignments changed and there were projects that we had started up that we stopped, put on hold, that we killed because it no longer made business sense. We needed to focus on something else to, again, address and meet the priority needs of our internal clients. And so this was a very formal approach to getting aligned and making sure that you were working on the key and critical stuff. And then the next dirt downturn, if you, they know that you're working on the really critical stuff that they need and want desperately, when it came time to do budget cuts and headcount reductions, we were protected because they knew the people at the top of the various functions in the enterprise knew we were doing them a service. We were focused on critical levers to improve their performance. Um, and so we were somewhat protected from budget cuts, from headcount reductions. Uh, these are critical things that I wish more people in the learning and development world, the performance improvement world, the training world would really embrace because one, it'll help us really do worthy work, worthy of the shareholders equity that we often convert into instructional content um, to make sure that we're working on good stuff important stuff. So I, I worked with Ray for those 15 years. We had some very interesting projects. We, uh, we did all sorts of things beyond instruction. We worked in 1987 uh, up in Prudhoe Bay on, on the one half of the oil fields up there that was run by Arco of Alaska and we helped them build a pay progression system via performance tests. So not knowledge tests, but to build performance tests so people could prove that they could actually do the work 
And those tests were proctored by experts who knew what good work looked like and whether or not you violated any of the safety uh, requirements. Um, and uh, this was all tied to people's paychecks, to their wallets, so to speak. And so you, we had a lot of attention on what we built. And it was well received. And our client, after a number of years of implementing and maintaining the system, the administrative systems we built, the 2,000 tests that we built for about 20 different technical populations, he moved to the Alaska Pipeline, which took the oil from the oil fields in Prudhoe Bay down to Valdez near Anchorage, 800 miles of pipeline. And, and we did the same project for him seven years later in 1994. Um, I learned a, a tremendous amount working with Ray, and uh, we co-wrote uh, the Quality Roadmap book in 94 with a ghostwriter. He and my uh, soon-to-be ex-wife, Karen, the three of us wrote that book with Bruce Wexler, who pulled together the book and tried to make it you know, more friendly than you know, the typical kinds of things that we would have written by ourselves, um, and that was often a struggle. But then Ray and I came together in 2007 and wrote a book that reflected the work that we had done in Prudhoe Bay and on the Alaska Pipeline and had done with other clients, Siemens Building Technologies. We built performance tests for their branch managers, for their uh, uh, technical sales engineers, for their salespeople, uh, for the installers. Um, we kind of handled all the key jobs in a branch. And uh, the, our client there was interested in, in, in improving the time to performance. So reducing the time to performance, making sure you had quality performers who knew what they were doing and you hurried that up and didn't take, you know, in the old days what they would take is, you know, going off to training classes and things like that and then you're never really sure, can people really do the job and managers aren't really sure and they send people on assignments and then if it gets screwed up, they're not really sure why. Well, we gave them a mechanism in order to test people's performance competence as part of their development as part of their compensation, performance reviews, and things like that. Um, again, so Ray Svensson, again, uh, you know, another one of the eight people in my top five. Another person is the first of uh, three Rogers, uh, Roger Addison, who I met because of my work in NSPI and ISPI, and Roger's been very, very involved in that. And he invited me to um, uh, become part of the uh, uh, instructor set uh, for what is called the principles and practices uh, workshop that he would deliver every year at, before the NSPI and ISPI conferences and I attended that and did that one year but then I got too busy to really participate and I'm sorry about that but uh, so but I've, I've worked with him on committees over the years um, he's a good friend and uh, I always learned a lot from him, and uh, most of it was, you know, just how to pay attention to performance and some, you know, uh, learnings f from of me, my learnings from his stories about his projects and the applications and tools and techniques that he's used, and you know, I borrowed a lot of things from a lot of people over the years, and I am not capable quite of giving them the exact credit that I should, but, you know, here's my attempt after that series of blog posts. This, the next Roger is Roger Kaufman, uh, who's been involved in the organization going way, way back um, to the very first uh, chapter uh, meeting of ISPI. Um, and uh, I've learned a lot from him. Uh, I learned a lot of his content. I mean, the man's written 41 books and, you know, who knows how many articles. But, um, but I always learned something when I, when I heard from him. But I had learned other people's models and had been practicing their other models. And so I'm sure that what I did is I borrowed little parts of things that I learned from Roger. But one of those parts was his concept of mega, social responsibility. And... Um, so we can focus on individual performance, uh, the worker. We can focus on uh, process performance, the work. We can focus one level higher on uh, organizational performance, the workplace. Or we can focus on something higher than the organizational performance, the enterprise performance. We can look at what are we doing to society. Roger calls that mega. And there's a good story. Um, of the fact that Roger Kaufman 
uh, and his there was a group called Tucson Seven in, in ISPI back in the uh, early two thousands, and they were they wanted something different from ISPI. These were all the you know the gurus, if you will, the top gurus, and they were coming together to talk about you know what ISPI should be doing for people like them because we're you know generally offering. Uh, sessions and programs and things like that for people who are at the beginning and intermediate levels but what are we doing for the people who are on the leading bleeding edge the advanced people so they started off by telling each other all about their own approaches and methodologies uh, and how they did their consulting work and one of them proclaimed after he'd heard from everybody and what they did and how they did it and all of that he says he said Roger Kaufman is the only person who gives a damn about my son because he's got this thing mega looking at for social responsibilities and R, he's helping to his clients change their practices and such so that they are not polluting the planet, so that they are, are looking out for the well-being of all of the stakeholders, including people's children. And so Roger added a dimension to you know how we might measure the success of our own work are we looking beyond the profitability uh, of an enterprise, of a corporation, of any uh, en enterprise, any organizational entity? Are they looking beyond themselves and looking at what they're doing for society at large and social responsibility? And so there's many things to learn from somebody like Roger Kaufman, and he's been a great friend. Uh, and I attribute all of his success to his wife, Jan. Um, who is a lovely person and Jan used to tie my bow ties for formal occasions when we would go to the uh, banquet sesh, uh, uh, at the end where the award ceremony was held at NSPI and all that stuff. Formal affair, not everybody dressed in tuxes, but I did and uh, others did as well and I could never master tying a bow tie. She would look at what I had attempted to do and she'd say, guy, come over here and let me straighten that out. So eventually I just would, would they'd see me coming down an escalator with my tie in my hand <laughs> And she'd be waiting for me, actually, before entering into the awards banquet room. They'd be waiting for me, she and Roger, uh, so that she could tie my tie or fix my tie. But eventually I just gave up because when you do it once a year, you know, and I had a job aid. <laughs> I couldn't follow the job aid. Uh, I'm not sure if it was me or the job aid, but I couldn't quite get it right. And uh, so she would fix it for me. So uh, I guess Roger Kaufman does a lot of formal affairs and she's learned to tie his tie as well. Um, but anyway, so he's the second of the Rogers, as we call them in ISBI. We'll get to the other one here in a little bit. Uh, Will Tallheimer, uh, somebody I also met from in uh, through my relationship with ISPI. I remember I videotaped uh, Will. I was looking at just the other day at the videotape I had done of his, he and his session back in 2009. He had set up a bunch of cameras. I had my camera with me. I set up and my tripod and I set it up and I got a, uh, the wide shot, if you will, of Will to, that I thought he might be able to use with his, uh, the other two cameras that he had set up. <clears throat> well, he decided not to work on that video and uh, I was just taking a look at it the other day to see what was in it. And uh, um, anyway, I'll share that with him at some point here. So that's a heads up, Will, that's coming. But Will has produced a couple of things noteworthy. Uh, the decisive dozen, what are the factors or variables that you need to look at to make sure that your instruction uh, is good from a performance perspective. He's also retooled uh, an evaluation model. So rather than have the four levels of the Kirkpatrick model or the five levels uh, that, um, now I'm going to blank on his name, um, that there's there's another model but anyway so he's he's got a, a framework now for really taking a look and doing evaluation that's going to have all the kinds of provide you all the kinds of de data back that will help you make sure that you're hitting the mark affecting performance um, that you are keeping it up to date and etc and I won't try to explain his LTEM model but uh, that's it and it's been out for a couple years um, he's been writing about this. He's got workshops on this. In fact, just yesterday he did a webinar for my Charlotte chapter um, 
uh, because of we're going through the pandemic right now, and uh, Will did that for my chapter. Um, I've seen him present on that before. I did not attend the webinar, um, but I'm sure it was a great success. So if you're interested in, in uh, re-looking at your approach to evaluating instruction, training, learning, then you should take a look at uh, what he's been writing. But anyway, he's a great friend, and he also uh, started the Debunker Club, uh, to try to build a small army, if you will, of people who will push back on the foo-foo snake oil BS myths that abound in the learning and development profession in the instructional arena. There's way too much of that, and so he's one of the people at the forefront of battling all of that, and not just telling people that they're wrong, but trying to understand what they were trying to do in the first place when they took something that's not valid and what they should do instead. And people like Will and Clark Quinn are, you know, advocates of battling the myths. There's many, many people that are now starting to do this, but um, there's so much money behind some of these myths that it's going to be a never-ending battle. And, uh, um, you know, good luck to us all in, in really addressing that. But Will Tallheimer is a, uh, um, I would have said that, you know, there, I used to refer to people as being the old guard, protecting the science of instruction, the science of performance improvement. And I would have called Will one of the new guard. But now we're all getting older. And so those of us who used to be in kind of the new guard <clears throat> are becoming the old guard. Um, as the musical chairs of life uh, get uh, shuffled around. The next person I'd like to acknowledge is Bill Wiggenhorn. He was my boss at uh, Motorola's Training and Education Center. And I have to say that Bill was probably the best boss that I ever worked for. Um, he was charismatic. We would have walked through fire for him. He was very concerned about us, our work, our clients' work. He spent most of his time in the 18 months I was at Motorola traveling the world to visit Motorola operations to understand what their critical business issues were to help align us to make sure that those critical business issues were part of the governance and advisory system and that we were working on those critical things and he was out there making sure that our customers internal customers were satisfied with what we were producing and trying to determine help them determine what else was necessary because as we all should know, instruction isn't going to solve the big issues inside a corporation. And he was bringing in people like Neil Rackham and Ray Svensson and Gary Rumler to address some of those issues. So it was because of Bill bringing Gary Rumler in that Motorola bought or licensed Gary's intellectual property when they created Six Sigma. And Six Sigma is all about variability reduction. And if you looked at the work, though, that Gary did across Motorola back in those days, it was really what would be called today lean. Streamlining operations, reducing handoffs, um, reducing the cycle time uh, of work. And when you reduce the cycle time, there was this magical thing that also happened. Costs were reduced significantly. If you took a process that might take 18 weeks to get it done and reduce that to three days, you not only made the customer happier for the quicker turnaround, but you also made the organization happier because you've reduced their internal costs to render that product or service to your customers. So it could be a win-win and that allowed you to reduce your prices in a competitive marketplace. That's important because now you could have, you know, if your, fe if your features were, were the same as your competitors, now you could reduce your price because you were getting things done much more quickly. You were reducing rework and scrap and things like that. Um, so it made just all really great business sense. Bill is the one who challenged us to move most of the content that we had from instructor-led classroom training to self-paced means. Um, and so I've been on that kick since 1981 when he challenged all of us because I think that's one of the things he heard from our clients at the top of the organization is that, you know, this classroom training stuff, it might be great and appropriate for some things, but if it wasn't really the way to 
to instruct people, to develop people, then we needed to find a different way that was more convenient for the world of work that we were serving. The managers and performers out there who needed to learn things and didn't need to necessarily wait for a classroom that was scheduled to come around on the calendar and then you'd try to sign up and the classroom was full so you'd have to wait another cycle. And so yeah, it made perfect sense what he was uh, driving us to do. So I, I credit Bill Wingenhorn with many things, introducing me to some really key people, uh, gurus in the business, my uh, future business partner, and for hiring me in the first place. Thank you, Bill. Um, the next person I'd like to acknowledge is Harold Stolovich. I've never worked really closely with Harold, but I've known him for a long time. I met him either in the fall, winter of 1979 or the spring of 1980. He came to the Detroit chapter of uh, NSPI back in those days, MSIT, the Michigan Society for Instructional Technology, and he came and he presented on the research. So before we said evidence-based practices, we talked about research-based practices or approaches, and Harold shared what the research was, you know, how it should guide us, you know, what was valid and what was not. And I was very appreciative, and again, this was my early days and months in the biz, and uh, Harold was instrumental in me uh, valuing and continuing to look at research. Now, I didn't go read the research. I relied on people like Harold who translated the research into practice. And I took my guidance from Harold and many others, but uh, um, he's, uh, he's somebody who is uh, very significant in my development, I think. He also, uh, John Swinney had told me this story about Harold uh, starting off a session at ISPI, NSPI back in the day, and when no one in the room could pronounce Tiagi's real name, Harold taught everybody to do that. So, because Harold had taught everybody how to do that, John Swinney knew how to pronounce uh, uh, Civil Asylum Tiago Rajan, and so I learned that from him. And so, uh, hopefully, uh, people the world will know Tiagi as by his real name and not this uh, facade that he's hiding behind. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, that's a joke at Tiagi here because he doesn't take himself too seriously. But Harold Solovich, uh, with his uh, wife Erica Keeps, wrote a, a series of books, uh, field books, and uh, the, the initial books on uh, telling ain't training and uh, training ain't performance. And so Harold has had this performance orientation and, he, and although like me, he's in the instructional design business, um, uh, he and many others taught me that uh, I needed to look beyond the knowledge and skills. I really need to look at what the other variables of performance was because our clients want performance. They may come and do a training request and and what, like Joe Harless taught us all, you know, not to say to the client, are you sure it's a training request? No, we needed to say, sure, we can help you and let's go do analysis, which is critical to smoking out, you know, what what's really at the root cause of their issues. Is it a deficit of knowledge and skills? Maybe. Oh, is it is it that and something else, or is it really just something else? And knowledge and skills has less to do with it than one we might believe. But you know, who is our client going to go to? They might think this is probably a training issue. They come to the training organization, and we respond and give them training, and it doesn't solve anything. And now we have a credibility issue with our internal clients. Um, the next person I'd like to acknowledge is Mickey Lane. Uh, I, I was on the board of directors at ISPI with uh, Mickey Lane. Uh, 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 we had uh, uh, board meetings in Montreal. I played golf with him in Montreal. Actually, I played with he and Jim Hill, who probably were annoyed with me because I'm more of a flogger than a golfer, and they were two pretty good golfers, and uh, so they had to tolerate uh, waiting on me, I think. Uh, my, my score was probably double theirs. but. Uh, Mickey uh, was another one of these persons, I can't tell you exactly what I learned from him, but I learned a lot. I was influenced by his work, his examples that he shared. Um, he was generous in, in reviewing, reading and reviewing my two books, Lean ISD, I came out with in 99. And in 2001, I wrote a book, a Training and Development Systems View. And he wrote me very nice, you know, marketing quotes, if you will, reviewer quotes about those two books and uh, I really valued his friendship and he's mostly retired now I think he's still up in the Montreal area uh, American by birth but uh, Canadian by choice um, great guy and uh, 
uh, he had written articles and things like that as part of NSPI, ISPI, and uh, served as president and uh, just an all-around great guy and a, uh, just somebody who is an exemplar, somebody to uh, emulate his uh, uh, approaches and practices. The next person I'd like to acknowledge is uh, John Carlyle, who I met in 1981. Uh, John was with Huthwaite and worked with Neil Rackham. And I got a chance to go to Sheffield, England, meet up with John, and go see him deliver uh, versions of his win-win negotiations program with his local clients. And so I spent two days there. We stayed overnight in a, in a place called the Studley Priory, something built in the 1400s. Um, <laughs> with uneven floors. I remember having to hold my wine glass on the table because the table was slanted and the wine glass would move around and because the floor was slanted because the foundation needed repairs and all this. And again, this was a long time ago. But I uh, had a very interesting uh, time with John. And then he brought over his win-win negotiations program. Neil Rackham had trained and, and kind of certified Barbara Warburton and myself to be behavior analysts looking at the behaviors at the program that John had delivered. So John became a good friend. Um, I recently did a video with him earlier this year uh, trying to catch up with him. I'd heard these stories about the work that he had done in Hong Kong in particular when they were in, in, uh, increasing the uh, rail lines out into the uh, uh, uninhabited areas because Hong Kong was exploding. Um, and they needed to go and and build out, you know, subdivisions is what we would call it in America. And they were built along the rail lines so that uh, people could ride the rails, the trains into Hong Kong and, and the air, that area to go to work and then go back home. And they built off was, uh, at every uh, one of the train stops, um, they built um, shopping centers and apartment complexes and things like that to begin to spread the masses out, if you will. And uh, John was involved in, in bringing his approach to collaboration and cooperation to that effort to bring in all these vendors from a bunch of different countries speaking different languages and to work together in unison to get this thing done on time and within budget. And they came in uh, before the deadline. They finished the project, the, all the vendors doing all this work, building railroad lines and stations and all of this. Um, and they did it under budget. So it was a huge success. And he says it didn't get very much press. Um, the press seems to like to write about much of the controversies rather than the successes in huge initiatives like that. It was a, a project worth a couple billion dollars, if I recall correctly. But John was very instrumental in teaching me more about what I had learned from spin selling, and this was all within the context of negotiations, but it was those communications behaviors, giving information, seeking information, testing, understanding, summarizing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I won't give away the whole model here. Uh, I don't know if Hathaway's still doing negotiations training in the same manner, but uh, it was extremely important to me and my own practices in dealing with my clients and with my subcontractors and with my staff. Um, there was a, many wonderful lessons there that I learned. So John is another one of these people. He's one of the eight people in my top five. Uh, Rob Fauché is somebody that I met back in 1982 when I was working on an NSPI conference committee and we were doing the marketing. So Rob Fauché and Odin Westgard and Mark Rosenberg and I were part of the group that was, they were focused on the Chicago conference, which was coming up in 84, but in 83 there was going to be a conference in Detroit and I was on that conference committee as well. Back in those days, there was a two-year run-up for a conference committee to start work, all the conference committees that were working to gear up for the conference, and it was all volunteers, no paid staff, uh, with rare exception. And uh, so the volunteers all came together to con hold the conference in their town. So I had been in the Detroit chapter, I was now in the Chicago chapter, and I was working on the Detroit conference, 
to kind of gear and help support that, but also to learn how to help support the Chicago conference. And so that's where I met Rob Fauché, who is uh, close with Judy Hale, brings a performance orientation to all of this. He was involved with Plato back in the day. Um, and he's just one of these people. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the key things I learned from him is uh, he really dismissed this notion of learning styles for me. And I think I heard him speak on this and maybe present on this before, but in the year 2000, it's on video, he, in the 99 seconds thing that kicked off the conferences, uh, he talked about learning styles and how it was a false notion and that there were so many competing uh, variations on that theme that there was no consistency and there was no research to back it up. It was just a, a notion that, you know, had been quite, you know, disproven. Um, but it's still prevalent and uh, here we are 20 years later and that baloney is still out in the marketplace and it's something, it's like a zombie that we can't seem to kill even with silver bullets and uh, golden stakes or whatever, however he kills zombies, I'm not sure. I'm not into all that. Um, so Rob Fauché was, uh, again, somebody that I learned from and I you know, can't be specific about what I learned from him other than the learning styles thing, which I already had known, but uh, he gave credence to the, the notion that it is really um, not true. Um, and there's no such thing as learning styles. And while people may even have a preference and, and declare a preference for learning one way or another, usually what you find out is that they don't even really practice what they preach about that, that they actually would prefer something other than what they declare. So it's, it's, it's the whole thing has got a bunch of uh, issues associated with it. So it's something to avoid. But um, the next person is Ruth Clark, uh, Ruth Coven Clark. Uh, um, she's been sharing her evidence-based practices and approaches in instructional design for a long, long time. Um, I've attended many of her sessions. I've read a couple of her books. Um, and I, you know, so I can't say again here exactly what did I get from Ruth, but I did get a lot from Ruth and uh, uh, consistent with uh, a lot of her work with uh, Richard Mayer. Um, and uh, you know you can find videos of her online and she's somebody to really follow and uh, take guidance from in terms of your practices and structural design. She knows what she's talking about. The next person is Carl Binder, who I've known for quite a long time too. I think I probably met him in the mid 80s to late 80s. Uh, he's been around for longer than that, but uh, I don't think I got, uh, got to know him very well. Um, I think Carl is known for taking Gilbert's behavior engineering model and making it friendlier with using more accessible language and I think that's one of his major contributions. But before that he was about performance measurement and fluency and how to build fluency. He kind of followed the, the, the teachings of uh, Ogden Lindsay uh, who was a big proponent of fluency. Um, Carl was, I think, uh, the last graduate student of B.F. Skinner and went to Harvard and, and uh, learned from Skinner and he brings all of that into his practices of performance improvement. Um, somebody else uh, that one might choose to follow and learn from. The next uh, six people here all come from the quality movement. I was exposed to their work when I was at Motorola serving manufacturing materials and purchasing. Purchasing's got to buy quality, materials got to make sure the quality is there, manufacturing does quality stuff with quality component parts, sub-assemblies, etc., etc. And so the names that I have here are uh, Walter Schuert, Bonnie Small, uh, Deming, uh, w. Edwards Deming, Joseph Duran, Donald Dewar, and Phil Crosby all come from the quality world. Uh, Walter Schuert was, uh, was working at Western Electric before Deming got there and Deming learned from Schuert and this thing called the Plan, Do, Check, Act cycle, the PDCH cycle that many call the Deming cycle is really Schuert's and Deming used to credit Schuert that but the world, you know, ignored that and credited Deming with it endlessly and so that's what it's become known as but Walter Schuert was really kind of the person who taught Deming all of that. Um, <clears throat> Bonnie Small worked at Western Electric also and she uh, took a lot of the teachings and learnings in the quality early days of the quality movement and documented those things. So I remember reading things that Bonnie Small had written 
uh, back in 1981 and 82 while I was at Motorola and her take on the whole thing that was becoming and kind of had become the Total Quality Management Movement, TQM. Before that it was known as Variability Reduction, you know, reducing variation in process to reduce variation in final products. Um, and so that whole chain reaction and how do you go about doing that as a statistician might do that and uh, as engineers might be doing that and how do they design experiments to make sure that they are you know reducing the variation in products via processes. Of course there's Deming. I've, I've read several of his books. Um, I never intended to become you know a TQM practitioner but I wanted to be cognizant of all of that so that as I help my clients, uh, especially when I'm doing analysis for instruction, to help them understand and identify and tag and then address some of the other barriers to performance that humans confront. And as Demi would have said, 94% of the problems are in the system under the control of management and it's not in the control or can't be impacted by the individual. Um, so it's helpful to our clients to point those things out when the training that's going to train individuals isn't going to actually make an improvement. Now if it's new hires, you know, my, my saying is that training requests for new hires should be expected and training requests for problem solving should be suspected. And I think that the lesson from Joe Harless is that yes, you take on the assignment and you do the analysis and you find out what really is at the root cause underlying the symptoms and you share that with your client and if you can bring your client along on that journey it won't be a surprise to them when the recommendation is maybe training is needed once you make these other fixes and then you need to train people how to deal with the new environment the new processes or the new way to handle materials or whatever the root cause was really all about once that was resolved you may have to train people awareness level, knowledge level, skill level, depending on what those new solutions set included. But training is, can be a part of that, but it's not, the, uh, it's not the key lever. Then there's Joseph Duran, who another quality guru like Deming had major impact over in Japan. There's two big competing awards for quality in Japan. I'm not re really aware of what's, what's going on nowadays, but back in the 80s, those, those were big deals, and Duran had a slightly different approach to quality than Deming. And there's people who would say that Duran gave you more of a cookbook approach, an actual step-by-step -step about how to get from here to there, and where the other quality gurus didn't quite give you that. So that's what he was basically known for, written a lot of books and all that stuff. Then there was Donald Dewar, and I came across Donald Dewar because Donald Dewar uh, wrote books and consulted on and gave workshops on quality circles and how American corporations could embrace quality circles to try to achieve what uh, Japan had done with quality circles. Um, that's kind of controversial that it wasn't really the, the quality circle kind of thing. It was really how the Japanese managed their whole supply chain for win-win kinds of relationships and improve their cycle time and costs and quality through that mechanism rather than having the workforce trying to figure out, you know, what improvements can they make and what problems do they see. Not that that's not important and valid, but that may not be the biggest lever. But I learned a lot from uh, reading the books of Donald Dewar because my client was at Motorola was very interested in the manufacturing materials and purchasing worlds about quality circles and how they might leverage that to improve quality in the, on the factory floor. Um, and then there's Philip Crosby, another quality guru. Um, and so I was exposed to his work as well, and so that had meaningful impact to me because to me it always seemed that quality and the stuff that Gary Rumler was doing was significant and important and should be married together. In fact, I wrote a white paper at Motorola after being exposed to all these quality gurus and seeing more close up the work of Gary Rumler, and I had made a recommendation that Motorola merge together three things the process orientation of Gary Rumler, all the TQM tools that were coming, and the communication behavior approach of Huthwaite, Neil Rackham and John Carlyle. Um, I wrote that white paper um, and my, my boss took that, I had a boss at that point, was no longer skip level reporting to Bill Wiggenhorn, but my boss took that and he decided that uh, that I, I submitted the, the white paper to Bill Wagenhorn and to my management 
And they all took a look at that. My boss decided, oh, he wanted to convert that into a do-it-yourself Gary Rumler consulting kit. And there's pictures of my boss, Paul Heidenreich, with the kit on a t-shirt. And Gary and I were meeting with Paul in Phoenix, Arizona, in Paul's office. Um, and we were working on the kit. You know, how do we take all this stuff? And my boss was less interested, even though he was a manufacturing engineer, he was less interested in the quality stuff as he was from figuring out this Gary Rumler stuff. In fact, he made the comment to me at one point that, you know, if we were to capture all of what Gary is doing and teach others how to do it, we won't have to pay his expensive rates. Fun, the funny story is that Gary and Paul were best friends, buddies. They traveled, they went on vacation together with their wives and all this other stuff. But Paul was a little skeptical of Gary Rumler and his expensive daily rate and how do we reduce that and get rid of that. But then he became a proponent of Rumler's methodology. They became good friends. Paul actually worked for uh, uh, the Rumler and Brace organization after leaving Motorola when, when Rumler started that, uh, that business up. But, uh, so there was this, this big uh, impact of the, from the quality principles and practices and the tools and the techniques that I learned. Uh, and I just skim the top. I'm not an expert in any of that stuff. I'm just cognizant of the fact that those have, some of those tools have specific functionalities and I needed to be, you know, aware of that, knowledgeable about that, uh, shallow knowledge, if you will. And certainly not skillful in any of those tools and techniques other than uh, those things that are kind of universals. Um, my nominal group process that I converted into the group process for analysis and design work in the instructional uh, domain, um, you know, are borrowed from someplace, you know, and I know not really where because, again, as I've said, I'm not an academic and I don't really think about it that way. I just take, listen to things and figure out how I might integrate them into my practices and I test it out and see what works and tweak it until it really starts working or I shed it because it doesn't work, which has been rare. Um, but anyway, so I learned a lot from these folks in the quality world. Back to NSBIers, uh, Frank Widra, uh, who had started the Michigan, and I didn't start the Michigan chapter, but he had taken over an organization that was started by nuns in the Detroit area that became the Michigan Society for Instructional Technology. And he took it over when he was a uh, a vice president at Allied Foods, a grocery store chain, and he needed some mechanism to train his management staff and the practitioners in the training organization. And, you know, it's an expensive undertaking, and if you can find some other group and then ship, bring people in to teach your people and others in your local geography, you know, that's what he did. Um, and so when I entered NSPI and joined that local chapter, um, I learned from the best, really the cream, the creme de la creme of the instructional design business and practices and performance improvement, and that was mainly due to Frank Widra. Um, I've told the story when I first uh, went to my first chapter meeting. Brian Desotels was telling me about what had happened in the prior meeting that happened before the summer break. And Frank Widra had cut the cord on the overhead projector and said, this is bullshit. Let's all reconvene in the bar. They used to hold their meetings in a, at a hotel or with a restaurant and a bar and a meeting room. And, and we'd have rubber chicken dinner and then we'd go listen to the presenter. And... Uh, um, anyway, so that's a funny story about Frank. It's a true story about Frank. He cut the cord, got shocked cutting the cord on the overhead projector, and, uh, you know, that uh, people who weren't too sure about what they were presenting that had heard that story would never go to the Michigan chapter present again unless they really knew their stuff and there was research data behind what they were going to present. Um, and of course, a newbie like me was very appreciative of the fact that that's the kind of organization I was joining. I was going to learn some valid stuff, you know, and not invalid snake oil kind of things. Uh, the next person is Jeannie Farrington. Um, Jeannie and I served on the board uh, at ISPI. She later on went, came, became a president. She had written articles with uh, Dick Clark. Uh, I was a student of his. Um, and I, again, it's one of those things where, what did I learn exactly from her? Um, well, I learned about the snake oil and to avoid certain kinds of snake oil that were prevalent in, in the biz. Uh, she had a book on performance improvement that she had written with her uh, 
ex-husband at that time, Jim Fuller, uh, which is a, a classic in the business. Um, and uh, so I value her friendship and uh, uh, greatly. Um, she's just somebody that I know that I've learned from, but again, if you were to hold a gun to my head, I probably couldn't tell you with great accuracy exactly what that was. Another person who wasn't part of the NSPI, ISPI fraternity sorority was uh, Don Clark, uh, more, more known as Big Dog, Little Dog, because that was the name of his website in 1995. I found his website, somebody probably had told me about it, and uh, he had great content. He had uh, write-ups about uh, you know all the gurus from instructional design. He had been in the Army, in the, in the training part of the Army, and uh, he had learned a lot, and he shared it. He wrote everything up. So uh, he was another great source for valid, uh, scientifically-based, evidence-based, uh, research-based practices. Um, and his site is still up. He's not very active on social media. He kind of dropped out of the scene maybe four or five years ago, but his content is still up there and it's a good source. So big dog, little dog. Thank you, Don Clark, for you know all that you shared and uh, all the lessons I was able to take from that. Um, Daryl Sink is another person that I've known from ISPI for, uh, back to the NSPI days for a long, long time. Uh, he and I shared clients. I had done a curriculum architecture design for uh, Christy Westall at Hewlett Packard and uh, Daryl's group uh, did the development of all that content and they won a big award. Uh, it was a very well received thing. The project was written up, the overall larger project beyond the instructional portion of it, was written up in Harvard Business Review but Daryl Sink's organization had put together the training. They had submitted that to ISPI, won an award. Uh, when they realized that, oops, they had left me off of the award submission, uh, my client was running around uh, the uh, ISPI uh, with a little write-up of the whole thing and crediting me for having been the one who had done the analysis and design and configuration of the content, the modular approach to instruction on a training development path for multiple audiences. Um, but they had won the award, and you know I was appreciative of the fact that they acknowledged me, even if it was late. But uh, but Daryl Sink does good work, and he's got workshops. I've I've had him come into the Charlotte chapter of ISPI to present, uh, did evening session and workshop, and uh, very well received. But uh, he's again another one of the exemplars in the business, and uh, uh, he's uh, practicing a valid. Uh, evidence-based practices and uh, he's somebody to learn from and he's uh, still active I think he's uh, bordering on retirement like I am I don't think he has the gray beard that I do but uh, but he is a gray beard nonetheless the next person is the third Roger I've mentioned him already but Roger Chevalier who who was a proponent of the behavior engineering model now Roger had been a leader in the US Coast Guard and at one of their training facilities out in California and uh, he had uh, heard about uh, NSPI and he'd, he'd gone to a conference, dragged off by some of his staff, and uh, he really fell in love with the uh, evidence-based nature of what they were proposing. And he became an advocate of that and a practitioner of that. And he left the Coast Guard and he went into the private sector, or public sector, I guess, or, and he went to work for Century 21, and he had a fabulous write-up about um, he had been put in a position here, he had 100 instructors working on training real estate agents and uh, he was told that he was going to have to uh, get rid of the 10 people um, because their uh, the level one smiles evaluations were indicting some of these instructors, these teachers. Um, and he, he thought, okay, well, I, not so fast, and he wasn't going to take the student reactions and, and use that as the basis for <coughs> um, firing people. So he looked deeper, and what he found is that the students from this one instructor, 100 of them, the, the 10 people that were getting the worst student evaluations had the students with the best results once they back, went back to the field. So if he would have fired those 10 people, he would have hurt the whole operation of Century 21 agencies around the country because 
the students didn't like the instructors because they were tough on them. They made them stick to performance. They made them do practice with feedback, authentic practice. Some of the instructors would keep people after class and force them to make cold calls. Which, if you know anything about real estate agents, they've got to make a lot of cold calls. And so these people were well practiced, didn't go out to have fun and drink and have dinner with their friends in the classes. They were stuck doing more additional practice, really honing their skills, and then release to the field. And of course, on their way out the door, they, they, <laughs> they gigged their instructors because, you know, these people were hard on them. Well, learning is sometimes hard. And when they got back to their jobs, they were more proficient than their peers who hadn't been through, put through the rigor that these 10 instructors were doing. And so what Roger was able to conclude and share with his management was that those are the best instructors we've got. The evaluation, the level one smiles sheets, as they're sometimes called, is a false lead. And we shouldn't follow their reactions. We should look at the performance did it transfer out to the workplace and how are those people performing? So now you had to take a look at your instructors from a whole different perspective, not the student evaluations as people were leaving the classroom training environment and going back to work, but you had to look at what were they capable of doing once they got out there. So if they needed to reduce by 10 people, there was a whole other approach that had to be taken. Um, so I was very appreciative of uh, Roger Chevalier, the late Roger Chevalier, sharing that. Um, he had his own spin on the behavior engineering model, um, as I said, and uh, uh, he was just he was on the staff of NSPI, ISPI for five years, I think. And uh, I have a video that I did of one of his sessions, one of his last sessions that he delivered at ISPI. Probably this was in I think 2012, but um, so I've captured you know one of his. Uh, one of his sessions and have shared that on YouTube. Another person is Ken Silber, who I met at the uh, Chicago chapter of ISBI. I think I probably knew NSBI, but I probably knew him before. Um, he was he worked at AT and T, which was one of my clients. In fact, I sometimes see him in the cube farms uh, where everybody sat as I was dealing with some of my client work, which was, they were centered in New Jersey, but Chicago was a big center and that's where Ken was. And Ken was uh, taught at uh, Prairie State uh, and other places, I believe. But anyway, so he was a big proponent of inst instructional design, performance-based instructional design, and looking beyond instruction at what was really going on. Um, in the business and uh, he's written a, a, a book I can't think of what the name of it is now but he wrote it with uh, Lynn Kearney and uh, um, but uh, so he made major contributions he's retired now I tried to catch up with him to see if I could do one of my HPT videos with him but I have not been able to uh, get a response from him um, sometimes people do that in retirement um, Another person I'd like to mention is Ryan Watkins. I appreciate Ryan, who's a professor at uh, George Washington University now, but he was a student of Roger Kaufman's. Um, and uh, Ryan is all about the research, and I really was appreciative when I was in, on the board and then when I became president of ISPI of his leadership of the research committee trying to make sure that they were bringing proven practices to the society and helping to separate the wheat from the chaff, the good stuff from the bad stuff, the valid stuff from the invalid practices. Um, and uh, so I really appreciate uh, what he's done. He's got a book out on needs analysis um, that was offered free. I think it was a project that he did with the World Bank, if I remember correctly. But um, anyway, so he's somebody I think that should follow. He's also got a website where they are sharing videos of overviews of research that students and others have done and so I think that's a great resource. I have not looked at it lately but uh, but I'm pretty sure it's still going on. Another person that I'd like to acknowledge is Tim Eskew uh, who's in the uh, Arizona Phoenix area I believe and uh, he worked with Bill Daniels and what I learned from him is performance measurement and project management techniques and how to engage 
large-scale projects, how do you engage all the participants in this? How do you do this in a meaningful, practical way that's actually going to have impact and buy people into the approaches? And so I remember attending a lot of his sessions at NSBI, ISBI, and I've done an HPT video with him back uh, 10 years ago or more. Um, but um, so he's another person, I think, and he's got several books out, and so he's somebody else to follow. Next is Jim Pershing, a uh, professor uh, at Indiana University uh, in the ISD world uh, who served on the board uh, when I was uh, president-elect and I think president. And uh, uh, I learned many things from him. He was the person who was the editor of the third uh, edition of the HPT handbook. Uh, and I have a chapter in there. Um, um, but uh, I learned from him when I was on the board that that we shouldn't shy away from debate in a professional society. In fact, that's what a professional society is all about, to bring ideas and research and evidence and research that's contrary to other research and let the debate ensue. And eventually we'll get to something close to the truth or the current truth. And But we shouldn't be worried about the amount of debate and arguments that happen within a professional society because that is its one of its key purposes and so i really appreciated jim he was the editor of uh, ispi's uh, performance improvement journal for a number of years um, and i think he he impacted uh, many people that are involved in instructional design a performance orientation to instructional design Another person is Karen Brethauer. Uh, she wrote a seminal article on maintenance of behavior. Uh, I don't know if this was in the 60s, I can't remember. I read it a long time ago. I knew about her like forever, and I didn't get a chance to meet her until she attended the 2009 ISPI conference when they were holding a, uh, a celebration of the late Gary Rumler's life and she had known Gary going back to the University of Michigan and she had been married to Dale Brethauer back in the day and so she and Dale were part of the group that presented about their experiences with Gary going way back and that was all captured on video and the Rumler family allowed me to do the editing and put together the video that's now uh, up on YouTube and available for all um, but I, it was a shame that I didn't get to meet her until that time. And I remember sitting on the bus going from ISPI over to the Expo Center. This was in Disney World in Florida. And uh, we rode together and talked. And I was surprised she knew a little bit about me. I don't know how. I don't know why. But, but uh, she was very friendly. And uh, I appreciate her contributions. But... Like many who were in the society and in part of the movement, they went into business and made impacts. And they didn't do a lot of writing about it because a lot of times their businesses don't want them sharing you know, their internal best practices uh, because it gave them a competitive advantage. So sometimes you're prohibited from sharing the things that you know, the things that you're learning um, because of who you're working for. But uh, but uh, her uh, article on maintenance of behaviors is really critical. And the whole concept is, is that you can teach people things, but you know they'll deteriorate over time unless they're reinforced. So how do you reinforce it? You know, from an instructional standpoint, we can do spaced learning, but that may not be sufficient. We may need to do things that are closer to um, um, incentives and you know deal with people's motivations and deal with their struggles and make improvements in the environment surrounding them um, it's because it's not always about knowledge and skills but if knowledge and skills aren't used all of the time in reinforcing their use they will eventually dissipate um, and so that was uh, what she had written about and I'd known about that article like forever, going back to the early 80s, uh, if not even earlier than that. Another person is Brenda Segru, who I worked with. Uh, she was on the board of ISPI when I was on the board. Uh, my business newsletter uh, back in the early 2000s uh, uh, printed, published some of her articles, a couple of her articles. Um, and uh, she, had she had done this presentation that I attended at uh, ISPI on 
Bloom's taxonomy and how there was no research underlying it. And so there's a lot of people who embrace Bloom's and use it to, as a means to articulate the learning objectives, um, but that it's, it's a construct that really wasn't based on any research. Um, now it may be helpful, and but she was saying, you know, instead of using the language that Bloom suggests, we, it, it, which at best is you know good for enabling objectives, but if you're going to look at terminal objectives, you shouldn't write them using Bloom's technology taxonomy. You should look at what is the performance, the terminal learning objectives, according to Brenda, should be the performance objectives, just as you would state what's the performance objective on the job. Never mind training, um, and. I was a proponent of that. I had kind of been taught that. Where I got it, I have no idea, but she kind of gave me license to kind of ignore blooms and to focus on performance objectives. Even my enabling knowledge and skill objectives are phrased in such a way that they're more performance oriented um, because I'm in serving business. I'm not in the educational realm where we're not sure exactly what your performance is going to be out in the world after you get a job, but we need we know you need to learn certain things to go on to the next level of courseware uh, uh, classes in a particular domain. Um, and so I, I, I really appreciate. Now Brenda has gone on to uh, uh, do some stellar work as a chief learning officer and uh, uh, she's somebody else I think that one might choose to follow uh, if you're especially if you're looking at you know how do I become a chief learning officer you know what what was her progression to that point um, and what can I learn and take away from her um, the next uh, person I'd like to talk about is uh, uh, Goldrat who wrote the uh, uh, I can't I'm not sure I can pronounce his first name so I won't try to do that and it's it's uh, like uh, I can't remember it. It's been so long since I really uh, read his books. But he wrote the book called The Goal, which is all about the theory of constraints. And this is kind of was kind of controversial because those who were pushing for just-in-time inventories and just-in-time manufacturing uh, would often uh, have issues with suppliers or whatever, and that would starve the process. So part of his thing was building up my, what might have been called safety stocks, which is a bad term, and and people shouldn't be you know collecting their own safety stocks so that they would always have something to work on. Well, there's a way to calculate what's the appropriate level of work of mat incoming materials into a process. How much of that do you need so you don't starve the process? Should you have a hiccup upstream as things go down, flow downstream? If there's a problem in step two, step three eventually runs out of things to work on. So if they would have built up a, a small inventory of incoming materials to step three from step two, if step two had a problem and had to shut down and do something and fix their issues, step, the process could continue. And then step two would eventually get fixed and they'd have to produce more to catch up and to even out this flow of, uh, uh, su you know, it's kind of su supply line management within a, within a, under one roof. and it, and it revolved around drum, buffer, row. So I had read the book, The Goal, and I had listened to the audio cassettes in long drives between Chicago and Detroit. I listened to the, to the audio cassettes twice. Um, very valuable, and he told the whole, he, 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 he provided me with the insights and knowledge through a series of stories at one particular uh, manufacturing operation. Anyway, so uh, very meaningful. He was a gruff character, um, but I think there's a, a lot that people could learn from him. So anyway, I wrote uh, and uh, you know acknowledged his contribution to my learning. I actually had a project with one of my clients, Bandag, who was a tr uh, truck tire retread operation, a franchise operation, and uh, they used uh, drum buffer rope to help their franchises, uh, franchisees uh, operate their businesses differently and more profitable. And they had a machine in the operation that was called the buffer, so they had to change the language from drum buffer rope because that was just going to cause confusion. So I forget what we called it, but this was a project I did back in the early 90s. And uh, they had great success. They produced 20 more product, 20% more product at 30% less cost. 
immediately after taking what the training uh, taught them and taking that out there to their operations and installing it and running their business differently. And uh, uh, so I learned a lot uh, about that. But again, you know, the specifics of that is just some of the co broad concepts that can be applied elsewhere. So that was the end of uh, the first set of these, uh, my first Friday Favorite Guru series of blog posts that I did once a month for three years. And then I came across Bob Horn and I asked if he would do a video for me and he agreed to. And Bob Horn is known as the inventor of what's known as information mapping. Something that was a big deal back in the late 70s when I first got into the training business, we were writing all of our stuff in an information mapping style. Um, and I again learned the derivative of a derivative of Bob Horn's information mapping thing, but I knew who he was. I saw him at NSPI conferences. Ray Svenson knew him um, and uh, introduced me to him. He didn't remember that when we finally caught up, you know, 25 years later or whatever. Um, but uh, Bob Horn is very influential, and I've captured this video of him, and he's working on sticky problems, significant problems, and he has a methodology for helping his clients do that. So he operates out of Stanford University, very sharp guy, um, and I would look at the video and follow up on Bob Horn um, because I think of his contributions. He's dealing with things at a strategic level at how, you know, uh, countries should address some of the stickier problems that they're facing. So he's not, he's operating way above an enterprise, way above individual performance. And uh, I appreciate uh, what he did in sharing information mapping and some of the other tools and techniques that he has shared with us along the way. This has been a long video for me to acknowledge my 42 key mentors. And of course, I've been influenced by many, many more people than this. These are the ones that I just thought I really needed to call out. There's others more recently that I should have been doing blog posts on. Clark Quinn comes to mind immediately. Um, and there's others too, and I probably shouldn't start because I don't have a list written down here in front of me that I can rattle off. But, uh, but there are many people that we can all learn from, and I think it's important to at least acknowledge their contributions or the fact that they contributed to me and hopefully if you do something the same you'll do a better job than I did and you'll know exactly what it is you learned from them so that you can be more specific about you know what you got from them. Anyway, uh, this is Guy Wallace. This is Adventures in Performance Based Training and Development with your host me, Guy Wallace. The series is also subtitled The Insomnia Solution not my insomnia, yours. Just kidding. Cheers.